Hello, everyone. Okay. Okay. Hi. Thanks so much for coming. I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much. Oh, hello. Some familiar people in here. Unfortunately, not Dr. Him himself. Let me text him. Give me a second, bear with me. He's kind of a Luddite, Jacob Ham. So maybe I shouldn't say that about him. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who has been reading the book and who, have, who has purchased the book. It's, you know, reading a book is such a commitment you have to sit there for so many hours with it that i feel so very touched and moved by anyone who's choosing to do it uh-huh oh awesome i'm so glad you enjoyed it <sighs> okay so dr hum is trying to request to join. Doc, okay. Dr. Hom, I'm about to send you an invite. It says invite. So please, I can't see you because you haven't joined, sir. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, hello. Weird. <laughs> How do I sound? I think you sound great. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So um, for anyone who does not know, um, this is Dr. Jacob Hom. He is a professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai. Um, he is also a clinical psychologist and the director of the Center for Child Trauma and Resilience. Um, and he's also my therapist who uh, treated me in What My Bones Know. He's the guy who uh, did Google Docs therapy with me in the last third of my book. Um, and just a little bit about how I found you. Um, I actually found you while I was listening to a podcast, which is a very me thing to do. Uh, I was listening to the Road to Resilience Mount Sinai's podcast and you were talking with Daryl Hammond about the Incredible Hulk, right? Can you talk a little bit about what you were saying? Um, yeah, I, I actually use this a lot with kids because I think that the Incredible Hulk is the perfect metaphor for, for people who've experienced trauma because um, first of all, uh, Banner had been abused as a child, his father had beaten him and had beaten his mother and even like shot and killed his mother in front of him and i think the father had substance abuse issues and he also had bullying so that's like four or five a scores already and now are you always diagnosing comic book characters mm, i should we should do a whole <laughs> thing about that they, they all are like archetypes of like some kind of human suffering <laughs> um anyway so he has a lot of trauma and the only thing that makes him different from other people with traumas that he's infected with gamma radiations. And so whenever he gets really angry and scared, he turns into the Hulk. And um, what is what is comparable to what happens with people with trauma is that um, when people with trauma get stressed out, their IQ drops, they can't speak more than like two syllable, two word sentences. Um, the angrier they are, the more hulky they get. 
And this is why I think that using like behavior management or punishments for children doesn't work at all because it just makes them more upset. They uh, also lose the capacity for self-reflection. So they, they can't, um, they, they aren't aware of what's going on. And it's only after like an hour or two when they calm down that they realize what they've done again. And they have their, they live with such remorse and regret about what's happened and all the destruction they've caused. So they go into Hulk mode. Yeah. I'm going to turn on. Okay. Um, yeah, it really captures the fact that like people with trauma, once they get threatened, they go into a different state of mind and they lose a lot of control over what happens and then they always feel bad afterwards. And so people with trauma end up feeling like they're broken in some deep way and unlovable and not worth the time of day. But. But um, the Hulk but, is one of our favorite superheroes. The Hulk is not a villain. The Hulk is not a villain, indeed. Yeah. And he's just trying to protect people, himself and those he loves. And so once we start to make friends with the Hulk, that's the first step in overcoming trauma, I think. Mm -hmm. So I heard you say this, and it was the first time that I had not heard of complex PTSD as entirely pathologized. And um, it was the first time I had heard of it potentially being a superpower um, and, and not just a disability, I think. Um, and it provided a healthier way of looking at it, because at the time I was really struggling with my diagnosis and making it feeling like it made me out to be a bad person, a damaged person, broken person. Um, and I did not want to believe that about myself. That was, I had tried a lot of therapies at this point, and this was kind of the last hurdle I really needed to get over. Um, and so I went to you in your office to, to interview you about the Hulk. And instead you wound up interviewing me, right? And then you offered to treat me for four months, which you did. Um, and we recorded all of our sessions. And I remember going in for our first session and saying like, I, I really need to reframe the way that I think about complex PTSD. Um, do you have any memories of me on my first session? There was one moment when you blurted out a paragraph long explanation of your diagnosis. I don't remember much about why that was so significant in that moment. I do remember when we were interviewing and you were asking me how therapy works and I couldn't explain it to you. You kept being annoyed by like the jargony stuff that I was saying. And it's, it really is hard to explain the experience of being held and healed by someone else. And so I knew that I couldn't explain it to you well enough. I, I just had to show you and that's why I offered to, um, but I could also tell by the questions you were asking that there was an earnestness and there was a personal angle to it. You know, like you were coming as a journalist talking, wanting to understand complex trauma, but I knew that there must be a, like a more personal reason why you're looking for this answer. And I'd rather just show you the answer rather than tell you what the answer is. Yeah, you kept telling me that um, it's like, interpersonal sparring that it's like playing racquetball like you don't get better um, about it. it's... <laughs> no, just laughing because we have this running joke where you keep calling it racquetball and i tell you it was squash and then it, i oh. keep that about not wanting to be called right told that i play racquetball okay whatever i'm not bougie <laughs> enough to play this game anyway um so you would talk about how it's like playing a sport where you have to practice the interpersonal sparring. You can't just read books and heal yourself in a void because complex PTSD is a relational trauma. So you have to fix, you have to fix it relationally, right? Well, this is where, this is why we're meeting today, right? Like what's so hard for me, and the reason why I, I find it frustrating to try to explain and help people outside of the therapy room is because it's not about knowing certain things. It's about experiencing life in a different way with, a, with another person. 
And so I'm hoping that today you and I can somehow describe the magic of what it takes to heal. Cause there's so many people out there who like are looking to us for answers and a quick or a quick fix or they can't find a good therapist or whatever. And I really hope that we can somehow create a moment where a lot of people are touched and healed today and get a feel for what it takes to recover. I don't know how we're going to do for that. Sure. <laughs> we're going to try a little bit. Yeah. Um, so um, we can talk a little bit about Google Docs therapy, which was something that was very unique, even even to your practice, I think, uh, which wound up being super helpful to me, which was because we thought maybe I would make this a podcast or something one day, we recorded all of my sessions. Um, and then at, immediately after a session with you, I would go down into the cafe and I would upload all of the audio, get it transcribed and put it into a Google Doc. And then I would start commenting all over the Google Doc and I would share it with you and you would comment too. And I would ask, what is happening right here? What are you doing? Why are you pushing me so hard? Why are you being a jerk? And you would say like, can you analyze why maybe you might be triggered here? What is going on here with you? You're talking nonstop over here, what's going on? And we would sort of edit the trauma out of literally my sessions and which I felt very comfortable with because I'm comfortable hearing my voice. I'm comfortable editing myself on a Google doc. It's like what I did at work all day long. Um, tell me a little bit about that experience. For well, Think about it. What happens a lot in therapy is that people, especially with trauma, they see trauma everywhere. Like the brain predicts and anticipates threat. Once you've been hurt, the brain says, I don't ever want to be hurt again. And so I'm going to, if, if there's an ambiguous situation here, I'm going to err on the side of assuming that you're trying to hurt me. And so things like that would happen between us where you would misinterpret something I would say, or you would take it as a criticism in some way, uh, in some kind of thing. I was always apologizing. And always like, yeah, thinking you were insulting me. <laughs> yeah which, you know, it was. I can see why you would think that, yes. Because <laughs> they're so mean. <laughs> um. Um, but so then I remember in the tape or in the Google Doc, sometimes I would say, oh, and here, this is what I was trying to do. Here, this is what I knew was going on with you, but I knew that you couldn't handle it, so I didn't want to talk about it. Or sometimes I would say, oh, here, I hate what I did here. I think this was a total mess up here. And so it's like really authentic and honest and like kind of behind the curtains for you. And I really hated that, that behind the in therapy before I really hated when I asked the therapist, like, what are you doing right now? At what point are we at our, at our, in our therapy right now? And they'd always be like, why do you feel like you need to know that? Do you think that's a control issue? <laughs> you know, like pathologizing my like desire to learn more about what this process is and you never did that you were always like i will tell you every sorry sorry uh you were like i will tell you everything i will completely give you insight to the whole process any question you want i will answer it and i just you were very vulnerable and i really appreciate that well th there's two reasons why i do that the, f the very first one is that it's a it's an act of cultural humility like i don't want to be the expert and okay, so the history of psychotherapy is that it's a, it's a one person therapy where the analyst is neutral, they do nothing. And so the only, they're like a blank slate on which you're projecting all your stuff onto me. But in truth, no one ever thinks of me as a blank slate. They see Asian men, right? And they make assumptions about who I am. And even the people who aren't making, who aren't reacting, it's like they have to hide behind a couch so that they don't even see the micro expressions on their face. Of so course. It's a lot of work to be that, that stiff. And in my own therapy, I found it to be very painful to be in front of that. It's like, um, it's like a still face moment, micro, micro moment of neglect. I, yeah. I was a still face experimenter, mother infant researcher. And so babies hate whenever their parents give, provide a still face to them. They, they need a, a live active mirroring other to play with so it's it's both that it's a way to say like i can't hide my racial ethnic gender identity and so i'm just going to be transparent about who i am and what assumptions and values i come in with 
but also it's a more modern type of therapy where it's like, let's not pretend like I'm a nobody. The, the person that you experience is both a projection of what you bring in and all your fears, but it's also my own stuff. And so I'm going to own that. And, and also with trauma, I feel like because people with trauma are always like second guessing what their impressions of other people are, and they lose a sense of like what's, they, they, they can't trust their own judgments. And they're so deprived of real authentic communication that part of the healing is both to recalibrate your judgments, but also to provide you with moments of real authentic joining with another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what was really helpful with us is just being seen, like learning how to express my needs to you and you being like, those needs are valid and I will meet them, right? And you did a lot of parenting for me. You did a lot of like, let's reframe how that, you're thinking about that. That's like, you would, well, and you, you were very Asian parent too, because you're always like, you're so stupid. <laughs> yeah but <laughs> but in a loving way you'd always be like you're so stupid why are you looking at it at that way you have to look at it in a way where well, you would always call me stupid whenever i was um expressing negative self-talk it's actually more complex than that i would call you stupid whenever you were in pain and i just felt like this desire <laughs> to hug and hold you okay. but it would be so inappropriate for me to get up off my chair and like just like hold you like a baby and be like, oh, oh it's okay. And, and so, it, it, was, it was like, <laughs> so it was part of my own discomfort about like the emotions I'm feeling, but it's also knowing that the pain that you were in were, was in part created by the constructions of the world you were making and the negative self-talk and all that stuff. And so in a way I can't help but feel like you're being stupid, you're creating suffering unnecessarily on top of your own like enormous amount of pain that you have to go through in life anyway. I mean, I never felt particularly, I mean, I felt judged, but I don't think I felt, I knew it was coming from a really healthy, happy, like loving place. I felt very cared for by you. So I think that was okay. Um, but you, you're talking a little bit about um, the truth of the, like um, people with complex PTSD, not being able to necessarily trust their perceptions or being able to be present in the perceptions in the moment. Because if you're triggered, you know, your perceptions are off. Uh, we might be, again, hyper vigilant in seeing threat where there is not threat. And I think what was really helpful is you providing that space to constantly be like, no, this is safe, this is safe, this is safe. And in times where I saw that to like, help me figure out what was real and one of the things that you really love to do that is a close reading, right? Like a close reading is very important to you. Yeah. And that was kind of where Google Docs came in. Yeah. Can I also add, it's not just that my point isn't always to say it's really safe, it's, it's safe, it's safe. It's more like I'm going to be honest with you about what I'm feeling. Because if you feel like you're mad at me right now, aren't you? And you can read that because through your training through trauma you can read irritation anger and all that if i lie to you then you're gonna you're gonna that's true no i mean we could practice feelings like anger at each other in a safe environment almost is that that's, like that's what i'm saying i'm saying i would if you pick up something i would say like let me think about it for real yes i think i am irritated with you i'm really frustrated with you right now you would and say that. If, and I would say why. <laughs> and I, I've learned over many years to learn to use my frustration and anger on behalf of my patients and clients, especially when they're hurting themselves, when they're depriving themselves of love and all that stuff. When, when I feel like they're thwarting their own health, I get really pissed off about it. And so I just own it. Yeah. Or, or whenever I feel like there's a, there's a rupture between us, right. there's a wall between us, and then I get really frustrated and angry about that too right if i wasn't listening to you you'd be like why aren't you listening to me but you wouldn't do it in it you wouldn't call me out in a really unsafe way and you you'd be like let's be you're not listening to me but like let's repair this together don't feel guilty don't feel bad don't feel like self-loathing instead figure out why you're not listening to me like instead like let's figure out how we can listen to each other and relate to each other on a healthier level. And that those are lessons that I could take out into all of my relationships. 
that was the hard part that it's so painful to because a lot of people whenever they feel that that, they, that they've done something wrong and you too like you immediately plunge right into such self-loathing <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's both frustrating and paralyzing because it's like ugh, like i don't want to keep beating you up but come on snap out of it like if you go into more self-loathing then you're really going to disappear from me yeah and then you're going to be lost in your spiral again and this is um the rupture repair style right which is something that you can that you use and some other therapists at mount sinai use and it's unfortunately pretty unique to um, big cities like New York, San Francisco, Boston. Um, and it's mostly the modern relational psychoanalyst is the broader term of where rupture repair fits in. And I don't, I don't know where you're going to find that. Um, and Irving Yalom is a classic example of the most popular therapist who uses this approach. He's a very popular writer and hopefully older either really old therapists who like feel really confident and own their style or really young brash therapists will be able to do it mm -hmm. but and it, yeah just to kind of sum up what we're saying rupture repair is sort of just like identifying ruptures within our conversation times when i'm not listening times when i might be triggered times when like you like stuff that's not quite right in the conversation and latching onto that and creating a repair like trying to figure out, be really curious, why is this happening? Let's delve into it. And how can we fix it and make our relationship stronger mm -hmm. after, right? Yeah, and in the classic rupture repair theory, there's movements away from or towards the other person. So like, it's basically avoidance or ag aggression, which is another way to say in the trauma language, fight or flight. So whenever you go into these micro moments of fight or flight, it'll right. look like either you change the topic, you stop, you don't finish your sentences, like especially when people are about to say something very vulnerable or painful, and then they just kind of trail off and then they're like, well, anyway, yada, 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 or whatever that is. Then you know, like, oh, you gotta finish that sentence. You have to finish right. that. Sentence. Then you'd be right. like, what? God, it's not a big deal. Or, or you would change the topic. And tell me, doc, how, what is it, how does it relate to the academic theory of complex trauma or something? And then I want to Yeah. Fight you on this because I didn't know because again when you're triggered you don't really have all that perception but what was really helpful is when I had the transcripts I could see like I just stopped in the middle of the sentence yeah, exactly. I went on a night like 180 away from the scary thing here or you know I remember on our first session and I wrote about this in the book um, I was I was going on for a page and a half just like rambling about my husband Joey's job and then you commented, I commented first. I said, I'm, I'm going on forever, which is so stark on a page, right? You can see like it, it's taking up the whole page of nonsense. And I said, what is happening here? And you said, ah, classic case of dissociation. And I said, why would I be dissociated? And I scrolled up and right before then, I had talked about, uh, I was telling you my childhood history and saying like, oh, my mom, you know, used to hold knives to my throat. And well, I, turned off my brain in some way to say that and then I got lost yeah. and I was like wow <laughs> you can totally feel when that happens um for me as a therapist what happens is that I either get lost in the story like I don't know what it's about I forget what the point is or um I get really bored and annoyed <laughs> and that's stuff that patient therapists aren't really good at feeling like they feel like it, you're being a bad therapist but to me it's a signal like uh oh you just disappeared on me and now i don't want to i can't even i'm not even a part of this conversation anymore i'm just like an audience of a play that i didn't even buy tickets for <laughs> i become an object instead of a subject instead right of two, two human beings talking and i could see like you know okay maybe this is why i haven't been able to connect with certain people or maybe this is why some relationships you know, I, I'm struggling within them. Exactly. And see that all in the script, but it wasn't like a condemnation. It was so clear it's because I didn't want to touch certain painful things or I was afraid or that I was trying to protect myself. And so mm -hmm. it, it was very difficult 
I, I could see this on the script and say like, I can change this. I have, I'm motivated mm -hmm. to change this. I know just how to change it. And also I'm not hating myself mm -hmm. for it. And as a therapist, most therapists have this, this vital flaw of being too polite. And so they don't want to interrupt you. They don't want to like shame you or make, tell you that this is bad or they kind of want to collude with this avoidance. Whereas in my 25 years of doing this, I feel like I can't collude with this. I can't abide by your dissociation taking over your, your authenticity. So I have to do this really rude thing of saying like, uh, what just happened? You just disappeared. And a lot of people do, this is why it feels rough to work with me. It feels shaming, it makes you self-conscious. You feel like you're gonna talk wrong or something and feel be criticized by me. Yeah, I, <laughs> I fight with you a lot, but it's, it's okay. Um, yeah, I totally like, I'm, he's always like, no, 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 no. Where are you supposed to be going right now? Where did you go? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm here. Look, I'm here. <laughs> I know. And then I, I would know, like, just go watch the tape, please. <laughs> True. There's a lot of homework that I have to go yeah. do. Watch the tape. Oh, right. Okay. I see what you're talking about. It's fine. Um, so I think one, you, you also did some traditional therapist -y stuff, traditional, I don't know, um, in terms of like, you made me do arts and crafts at one time. You made me like draw a circle around my feelings to see what appropriate feelings I had. You, you do a lot of IFS right now, which is internal family systems in terms of like, uh, talking to my inner child. You're always forcing me to talk to my inner child. Um, you so I can create. <laughs> You fight me on that every time too. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not just rupture repair. You do you do use a lot of different modalities. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, I use the metaphor of mixed martial arts a lot because I used to do a lot of mixed martial arts. But it's like um, I feel like therapy at its worst is like early UFC, where it's like karate versus kung fu versus wrestling versus jujitsu. But nowadays, like mixed martial arts is just about like fighters who like practice every fight, form of martial arts at every distance, just because like the, the fighting teaches you, like the being in a real fight teaches you what works. And so you and I are in a real fight. That's, and so, and I keep asking you, was that good? Did that work? Am I helping you? Because I want feedback about whether or not what I'm doing is effective. It's true. And sometimes you bounce back. Like sometimes if IFS isn't working, like we'll go try to something else. If we're not, if that isn't working, we'll try something else. And so what's really nice is you have a bunch of different things in your toolbox, which is really important for complex PTSD survivors too, is to have a bunch of different things in their toolbox because not everything works all the time. Sometimes you need to do uh, some meditation. Sometimes you need to like do some healthy self-talk, you know, and, and you also did yeah. a Oh, sorry, go ahead. The other thing that like, I do is that I, sometimes I say like, holy fuck, I don't know what to say next. I don't know what to do with it. True. And, or sometimes like, especially when we're in the good place where like you told me something that's like awe, awe-inspiringly painful, the only thing Like when, when I can get you into a place where you are vibrating with authenticity, then there's very little for me to do. And then it makes me vibrate with authenticity. And then we feel this like form of like intimacy. Like I don't want to, it's a weird cheesy word, but it really is like this moment of real seeing of each other. And I think that's what's healing because people with trauma rarely get that. Yeah. And it makes you more capable of being seen by others and knowing that like being seen is, is okay and safe. That's everything. That's it all boils down to that. Yeah. Can you be seen again without shame, without self-loathing? And I think there's a lot of parenting that you wind up sort of doing to reparenting, not parenting. Um, yeah in terms of like seeing me in my most vulnerable states, you, you, even if they are like kind of sobby and crazy, like when I'm totally broken down, but you are there with me being like, it's okay to be this way. And like, 
yeah, just holding me in that, I guess, metaphorically, not physically, but. I remember this and it's more, what, what I remember seeing is this super angry little girl and it was like, um, yes, be angry because the anger is saying, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be treated. I deserve to be loved. And what you're doing to me is violating me in a deep way. So you being angry is actually an incredibly powerful place to launch from. And I'm so glad that you still had that. And I remember feeling shame about it and being like, are you sure it's okay to be angry? Like, I just went from being self-loathing to angry. This isn't healthy. And you were like, no, all the feelings are healthy. Well, the, inten the intentions behind the feelings are incredibly important. Each emotion is incredibly useful for us. And we, we do, it as, a, as a society, we do really bad things to anger when it's one of the most important, empowering feelings. It's like just anger, outrage. Those are all important ways to fix wrongs in the world. And right now, like people with trauma, they, their anger takes, gets the better of them and they act out in ways that are destructive to relationships. And even in, relation, in couples that I see, anger gets misunderstood when most of the time, anger that I see is not, it's never meant to hurt another person. Anger is usually meant to say like, stop hurting me, wake up. I need something from you and you're not responding. So I have to like escalate my frustration to get you to pay attention to me. So I help people see past anger and see it as like a, trying to, as a, as a shaking of like, please mom, wake up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, what was really, what sort of helped me close out part of my, my healing process was that I knew I had come across a lot of tools that helped me. Um, I was feeling generally pretty okay about myself. But whenever I wasn't feeling like blissed out, I was feeling so judgmental, because I had this assumption that normal healed, like healthy, not traumatized human beings are just happy, go lucky all the time. <laughs> which is not true. Uh, There's two things, two really important things you said that I wanted to get to. One is that um, I think all of my work is about really understanding how people relate to themselves and tweaking that. It's like doing couples therapy with yourself all the time. And then the other thing was um, our understanding of what life is supposed to be like. And a lot of people come in hoping that I can make them happy when I actually want them to be able to learn to be in pain and be happy with as much like abandon as possible. And that's how you actually like, life is supposed to be ups and downs. And the more you can ride those ups and downs fully without self-criticism, without catastrophizing, without judgment and fear that this is never gonna end and all that stuff, then you become like Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> like Buddha. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I mean, technically, that's true. Like the middle way is about like not <clears throat> ego while you're living life. But. Yeah, somebody once told me that the, um, I don't remember where this is from, but apparently the Dalai Lama is very, I think you, you might call him unstable because he's like laughing hysterically one minute and then crying the next. But I think you know, what might seem to us is like, why is the Dalai Lama feeling so many erratic feelings is that he's really just like, able to healthily express what the appropriate feeling for the moment and you kind of Exactly. Want yeah. me to that. <laughs> so even like there's, I was gonna say that I'm glad that you had anger because it's an incredibly powerful, like, accelerant for change. But people who live with anger, the thing that it's harder for them is to live with vulnerability and, and pain because you go into self-loathing instead. And so the, the, the next stage of your treatment is a lot of like, can you sit in the thing that you wallow in and get stuck in, but do it with love? Can, can you feel all the painful feelings? And when you're in there, I need to sit there with you and hold that with as much pain as possible myself without being overwhelmed with hopelessness and despair and self-loathing and all that too. Because if you're there long enough, 
then this inner healing, this inner self-compassion and love can start to come out. If you can keep, just keep the self-loathing at bay. Because again, like none of us ever deserve to be treated like the way we are as little kids. They're so beautiful and innocent and precious, even if they're a pain in the ass. Right. Because if, if I've messed up in my life, the, the, the uh, instinct is to either go to like, well, fuck you and whoever made me do this in the first place, anger, like def full defensive armor, weapons out, or take that sword and jam it right into my own heart and just be like, you fucked up because you're an idiot. And there's, we need to have that healthy meeting. Grab you and want to slap you like, no, 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 no. Get out of that. We have to have that place where I said, you know what? I messed up and I'm a good person. And let's look into the ways that I'm doing, why I did it. And let's be curious. And let's be curious about how we can do better next time. And like, let's that's get appropriate. Too intellectual. Huh? Even that's too intellectual. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the love the inner child who messed up first, right? I got to give her a big hug. Is that? You sit in the pain of, you sit in the pain of remorse and contrition. I screwed up again. Oh, that hurts. I hate messing up. I hate making my friends angry at me. And you sit in the fullness of that pain. And then you start being like, it's okay. It's okay. I love you nonetheless. And then after you do that for a while, then you say, come on, let's figure out how to do this differently. <laughs> What's that look on your face? I'm so bad at this still. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wish we could have done more. Never ends. That's true. Yeah. It takes a long time. Shit, you just did it. You, you had a little micro self-loathing moment. <laughs> you see how close he's always watching me? You guys, you see this? Ugh. No, it's good, though. It's fine. <laughs> um... And this is how we fight it out and it's okay. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, I think some people were asking this earlier, how do we look for a therapist like you? Maybe not like you, but how do we look for a therapist who can specifically treat complex PTSD? It's not the easiest thing in the world. I wouldn't know. All I, all I say is, um, ask them questions, push them, challenge them, see how they fight, see if they can fight well, see if they can acknowledge their mistakes, see if they can hold you in your mistakes without judgment, see if they can be flexible and listen well. I don't know. It's, do you want to talk to them? Do you want to have a beer with them? Do you want to, does it feel comfortable? That's probably more important. And each therapist is going to provide what they can. And then once you like milk them for what they what knowledge they have and wisdom they've earned through life, then you find another one. It's not just one person and you'd be grateful for them and you thank them and you grieve the end of that relationship and you find the next one. Yeah. Keep going. I've like 10 therapists and like three that I've had for extended periods of time. Yeah. With this one patient, like I told him like, brother, I can only get you to 80% healed because that's about as far as I've gotten in my life. And then once, once you caught up to me, then you need to go find someone else ahead of us and tell me what you learn. That's so honest. Yeah. Well, okay. Like what are some of the questions that you can ask a therapist? Like I, I'll start off and just turn in, in terms of like how I found you and what, like, I feel like I'm going to ask my therapist moving forward. It's just kind of like, um, are you going to draw back the curtain? Are you going to be the wizard of Oz? Or are we going to collaborate on me together? Mm -hmm. Like, is, do you, can you see this as me being a project we can both collaborate on? Is this therapy mm -hmm. as a project we can both collaborate on? Or is it more like, is your philosophy more like you're fixing me from up high or something? Um, yeah, exactly. But some people need that too. Some people really do run with that kind of therapy where they, they really want an expert to take care of them. Mm -hmm. right. They answer right i think it's hard so i think you're kind of struggling to answer what would work for anyone with complex ptsd because people are very different and lots of different modalities work for different people with ptsd like and i feel like the reason why i blog is so that 
people know how I work and the people who would fit with me come to me and the people for whom it's a turnoff, they just don't waste their time or mine. Don't you think that some people are more like people who don't specifically have trauma training? I don't know. Don't you think some people are sort of more qualified in some way? Trauma training? People who are humble about their own suffering, who have mm. gathered wisdom about life through the through living their own life, I think they're pretty badass. Yeah. Not people who um, are wedded to a model or or like it's like a cult. Some of this stuff, like yeah, some of the models become culty. I've had therapists who are literally reading out of workbooks trying to treat me. They're not. They're just like working out of the workbook, and I'm like, dude, you're not being present here with me. I think that was what was really important for me too, and what why our therapy worked is because you were so vulnerable. You were really able to. Sh admit like yeah i have no idea what's going on here or i'm fucking up right now or like sharing like oh i think that you know this triggered me from my own past you were pretty open about your own i mean not too open but you were like pretty open about your feelings i'd be open about my reactions not about my the details of my past yeah and then i think uh yeah i i think somebody just asked was it important that i have an asian american therapist um you know i don't think that it was important to me at that point i was like anyone it'll be fine <laughs> uh but in retrospect i'm really glad that you were i remember there's this moment where you were like you are tiger momming your recovery and if a white therapist had said that to me ooh, i would not have had it <laughs> i would not have accepted it but i when with you, I, I knew where you were coming from. I was like, you're right. I absolutely am. Um, so that being said, my last therapist that I had for eight years was white. I, I did make a lot of progress with her. Um, she was a white lady. And um, uh, so I don't, I don't think that those narrow constraints necessarily um, are necessary, but they can be helpful, right? Yeah, it just becomes another, like, I, I know people who like um, misuse, make make us greater assumptions because of, of my ethnicity, you know, like they assume that I understand what they're saying or, or it's, I don't know, it's mixed. None of this matters in the, in the end. Each person has to figure out what their own standards are, what works for them, and it really doesn't matter. Everything can help like there's there's no need to be tight about it you need a you need to swipe right on like a hundred different therapists before you find two or three that you're worth that are worth dating i think that's true um and what allowed me to continue trusting dr Ham when he made errors i mean you're everyone's human you made it safe to be human in that space and also you're incredibly competent and smart so i felt like i was in good hands um I think, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think IFS is helpful. EMDR was helpful to me. Um, I think there's no mo single modality that is like inherently culty. I think it's kind of like who's employing it and how they're employing it, right? Yeah. Oh, and I was gonna say like the, the, the poor therapist who's using a manual, my first, response is like, oh, bless your heart. You're, you're that nervous. You're that insecure. That like, you don't own your work yet. You're, you haven't, it's not in your bones yet. The work, you know, it's like, it's not muscle memory. You still are, you're still in like training camp where you're like needing the training wheels. I mean, she was like 65, but. Oh, oops. <laughs> um. if, 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 a, if as a patient, if a person did that, I would just fucking walk out. What I needed in my own healing, God, I remember I went to a psychiatrist once and the first thing they did was to open the DSM and they just like went down the list of criteria. And I just, mm -mm. no, 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 no. I think, yeah. <laughs> also somebody who is gonna recognize complex trauma as real is very important to me because I'm not gonna waste my time with someone who doesn't, who doesn't even know enough about complex PTSD. They clearly haven't studied it at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Um, and somebody earlier asked about MDMA. You're a fan of MDMA therapy. You believe it's very Dave, incredible. It's it's on the verge. It's going to be like a year before it's officially approved by the FDA. It's in phase three of clinical trials. I'm actually going to be trained in it next month. As hey. a therapist. Cool. I've I've had plenty of patients, you know, not with my prescription, but who on their own go do psychedelics and then they come back and tell me about it. And sometimes it blows my mind what they do. So I could do Molly with you. <laughs> okay, we don't have to. It's fine. Um, no, but I, I have not tried MDMA um, in a clinical setting. However, like I have done acid and shrooms a lot individually um, and it's been very helpful to me in my healing journey. Um, From what I've seen, it's incredible. But it, it's not a cure-all, it's not a magic pill. It reveals a person's true soul. And then once you're back, you need help figuring out how to be that person that you saw in the medicine. So it, you don't, it's not, you get a glimpse into what your world can be and you understand that you need constant work in order to stay in that high because you can't be high on MDMA all the time. <laughs> you have to like, but it gives you the incentive to be like, look, gratitude is something I really need to practice more of, right? Or like mindfulness needs to be a part of my real, my practice because it can bring such bliss, whatever it is, right? That's what it did for me anyway. Honestly, it's just like, um, it's so cheesy, but the answer is just love. Sometimes the medicine allows people to feel love for themselves or to know that love exists in the world. And otherwise, like I spend years trying to help someone not be oppressed by the terror of like self-hatred. And for a brief moment, they can have a respite from that and just feel, I've, I knew a woman who said that while she was under the medicine, there was a, a version of her that she didn't recognize that just kept saying, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. You don't have to carry this. Yeah. That's very much what a good shroom trip is like. Um, so I just want to say, like, it's hard out here to find a therapist. Um, therapists have really long waiting lists. Everyone's really depressed right now. If you can't find a therapist right now, what are some things that we can practice? Let's do oh. that. Yeah, that's all I care about today. Okay, let's do it. All the Where people who get therapy right now can't afford therapy or... Huh. Okay, what do we need to do? What's, what's broken first? Let's talk about what trauma does to people. The essence of what trauma does. It makes you afraid of other people, that they're out to get you. And it makes you think that you're unlovable. And it, and it recreates the pattern of trauma, fear, neglect, abuse in the way you treat yourself, the intrapsychic fractal. The interpersonal fractal becomes the intrapsychic fractal. The interpersonal events become intrapsychic fractals. Nobody knows what that means. Yeah, I know. It means that you recreate the same patterns in your head with the way you treat yourself. Yeah. Okay. You have the abuser kind of doing it in your head to you all the time. Yeah. Yes. Like harsh inner critic is the most classic abusive part. Right. So get to know how you treat yourself. Understand all the functions of all those parts with love and reception. You have to like basically bring everyone back home. Everyone's been out in the cold playing these very rigid roles like the inner critic who's just like constantly beating you up and saying, you're no good, you're, you're not good enough to do this. And you have to tell that poor inner critic, oh my God, you've been working tirelessly my whole life to keep me from being in trouble again, from, be, from having people be disappointed in me. You need to take a break or you deserve to take a break because we made it, we survived our childhoods and you, you deserve a break. And guess what, it's, it's okay. I can, I can survive a little bit of of a little bit of disappointment and failure. And you have to thank the inner critic for 
have to thank your hulks for protecting you your whole life or lashing out at people when it was worried about you being hurt again. You have to protect the part of you that can't talk to other people because it's like, it's just trying to save you from more humiliation for crying out loud. And you're like, oh, my, my poor thing, you're working so hard. You guys are all overworking. You're like overprotective of me now. But then you have to prove to those parts that you can endure pain and and take risks. And then behind oh. all those, you have to start to also look at, find all the hurt little kids in there. And that, oh my God, once we get to that part of the work, people freak out. They don't want to do it. They hate those little kids. Yeah. It's, it's too pathetic and cringy. And just, we yeah, exactly. Or they're too late. That part is dead in me. They're right. Hopeless. For me, I think it was like, oh, I'm not a kid. I'm a grown ass woman. And a grown ass woman doesn't need to talk to a little baby version of myself. Like, as if I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I, uh, yeah. That's the teenage foo who like conquered the world and like figured it out. See, whenever, yeah. the little, whenever that, whenever the little girl starts to feel scared, then that teenager says like, no, fuck that. Let's go, let's go kick ass. And yeah. it's only to protect the little girl from being, it's protecting you from feeling those feelings again and it's protecting the, protecting the little girl from remembering those feelings again. So a lot of it is um, sort of identifying all of the parts that you hate about yourself and making friends with them. Spending Loving. time with them, uncomfortable time, but coming yeah. to hate yeah. the things that they've done for you. You have to build a relationship with them instead of telling them what to do all the time. You have to listen to them. That's that's where the listening part is really cool because when you like sit there and you say to your inner critic, why do you do this to me? And then you have to literally wait for like minutes and wait for it to tell you. That's when you're, there's like a convergence of all these different theories that are happening in the attachment theory, it's reflective function where you're, and it's mentalizing and in somatic work, it's just like this inner focus, attention, mindfulness, all these things converge because it's all activating the same parts of the brain that are prefrontal or uh, default mode network, if, depending on if you're using neurobiological theories. But it doesn't matter, like all that, throw it out the window. You should never know that stuff when I'm in the room with you. All you should know is that I'm asking you to sit quietly and listen to yourself. But I can explain like seven different theories about why this is so important. Right. It doesn't matter. Right. Be ordinary, just be a middle-aged pudgy man therapist with <laughs> just <laughs> asking you to do something that you're uncomfortable with. So looking at all of your reactions objectively and compassionately and um, trying to make sense of why they're there, what function they serve, um, and trying to find the truth of the situation, um, I think that's really key. I the beauty of the situation. Okay. The beauty of the situation, the beauty of your within yourself and your situation. I think, uh, I think that's one really key thing. Being in community. But I. But why do I? I. I. I want to explain why it's more important to look for beauty rather than truth. Okay, you can do that. Let's do that. Truth is sterile. Truth is your is your academic brain, your seeking, intellectualizing brain taking over. Beauty is a state of wonder, awe, profundity, complexity, where there's pain and joy intermixed. There's a transcendence of ego. It's, a, it's more of a feeling. It's, a, it's like looking at truth that's awe-inspiring and hu humbling, but also bigger than you. I don't know. That's how I understand what it should feel like when you're looking for it. You know you've hit it whenever, when there's this feeling, not this truth. Not, yeah. a, not, not the correct facts, but the correct state of relationship to oneself, of openness and wonder and curiosity and love. Yeah. Um, some people are commenting, how do you see beauty 
in such horror, horrific things that they've experienced. Yeah. One, if you're just looking at the horrible parts, you should feel horrible. If for intense, extreme emotional events, be appropriately that emotion that pairs with that event fully. And in that moment, you don't, have, you're, you're not being beautiful. You're just being in it. But then if you can metabolize that and process that it somehow dissolves itself. I think, you know, one of the things that I did, I was like freaking out kind of before the book came out in the week, two weeks before the book came out. And I had to have like emergency sessions with you because I was like losing my absolute mind. Um, and one of the things that I had to do, because I was kind of like, I'm not at all qualified to talk about complex PTSD because I'm like a crazy person. Um, but uh, one of the things that you had me do is talk to that inner child. And you you were like really particularly um, so um, qualified to tell me how much I have grown and how I was qualified because I've like pushed and worked so hard. Um, and I was able to bring up that inner child of being 17. Um, are you stuck? No, I'm You're just listening. <laughs> Sorry, you were just not moving. Um, and it, how it actually, what's happening to me is that I'm seeing this little girl part of you and it's starting to make me feel <laughs> I'm waiting says like a robot um <laughs> it is starting to make me feel um okay <laughs> I'm trying to reserve what i'm feeling until it's appropriate to share well i was anyway i was talking to my 17 year old self and just talking to all these different inner children and i found this just immense like pride and love that she didn't kill herself because i that I was still here, that I made this thing happen just by the pure, like, forward motion of surviving. That's that badass high school, that teenage version of you that kicked ass. Yeah, yeah. and and she was horrible. <laughs> I mean, no, she was not horrible. She was just very angry and scared and toxic and suicidal and, like, not toxic. I don't want to say toxic, but she was, um, she was a ball of knives just mm -hmm. whirling because that's how she knew to survive. But I was so grateful for her because she fucking did. She did survive. <laughs> she got me here um, to a place where I could, you know, work um, on myself and and heal. And uh, yeah, now I'm crying. <laughs> so I don't know. That's kind of like the beauty in the. Of you know why you're crying? <laughs> what? Can I explain to you why you're crying? Why don't you do that, sir? Man, explain to me when I'm crying. <laughs> uh, I, I heard this beautiful thing on a podcast once. And I forgot which one it was. Maybe Radio Lab. They were asking, why do people cry tears of joy? Because <laughs> tears are usually associated with sadness, right? And their answer was that there was some researcher somewhere, I, I forget. They said, tears are actually a signal of a relational intent. And the tears are a signal of saying, like, I want to be closer to you or I want you to come closer to me. And so when you're crying, I thought that you were reaching out to hug that teenage version of you. Yeah, true. Yeah. You're, it's, you're so grateful to her. So anyway, that is my example. <laughs> of, uh, well, for, for me, what really, what I can't wrap my head around, this is like this, I mean, like fucking all this weird fact about you is that I, in, in your book, you talk about this one abusive thing where you were such a good writer as a little girl. And then whenever you used to make a mistake, your mom would make you stick your hand out and she would hit your hands. And when I read that, I wanted to go throw, throw up and like, to, um, and also detonate a nuclear bomb somewhere at the same time. Well, don't do that. That would be bad. Yeah. That right now. 
but it's just so disgusting. And, and then to realize that you fucking did it through writing, like this thing moment now that you're still that little girl who still kicks ass at writing. And instead of like sticking your hands out to be beaten and you're gonna be like, fuck you with trauma. I'm not gonna take this anymore. I'm gonna, this is my gift, not yours. It's true. And, uh, you know, there, sometimes I still get the slap. Some people, they leave me like mean comments. But I think more than that, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I've been getting so many wonderful comments. Um, it, it's like the opposite. I'm sticking out my hand. I'm like writing the thing. I'm sticking out my hand. I'm being like, how is it? How are you going to hold it? And so many people have just been leaving me messages like this is a life changing book. This is changing how I think about trauma. This is um, giving me hope. And, um, I know. you know, that I, I actually resonate with that feeling so much. I, it's like, despite how broken and imperfect I am as a human being, good things can still come out of me and happen through me. And then I just sit in gratitude and rever like reverence for how crazy this life is. And I think, yeah. It's so cool. So cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, uh, we're about done. Um, you, we've had like 80, 90 ish people around here, this whole, um, talk. So thank you so much for coming. And I'm, and you know, I'm sure other people have said that they want to, they're going to watch it afterward um is there anything else that you just want to like leave people with um you know before we go the the, the visitors here yeah but it's not words it's like i know that i feel like my heart is full and it's like doing that thing that the instagram hearts are doing where they're like spouting hearts <laughs> And I really hope that that's what we do. That that's the point of this, right? To to open hearts, to let them feel more, to help us all feel more connected in our pain and in our joy. And I hope that that that's what we accomplished today. Um, I think that's so true. I think you know, as I have, lots of people are like, you know, you're affirming me and my story by writing your work these words and when people come back to us and to you who have healed who've been healed by you or people who have been healed in some way by this book and say like me too me too me too it's like well you're healing me <laughs> right back like we're all affirming each other this is a circle of love we're all like in this community in the, you know exactly. of wounded healers and survivors um uh, weird time to be like hey um buy my book <laughs> uh but i did write a book and it's called <laughs> oh, no. and uh a memoir of healing from complex trauma and um so like since the hard copy hard covers out buy the audio and oh, you can hear us in the audio book yes because we put snippets of our therapy session in the audio book uh, I think, you know, I think the hardcovers are supposed to come back. They're all like mostly sold out, but maybe your local store will have them. Um, but they will be hopefully back in stores around the 11th of March, fingers crossed. Uh, and, uh, yes, the audiobook has the actual recordings of Dr. Ham and I's sessions. And you said that you put in me calling you stupid in there. Do you somehow like edited that so that I didn't know AI could make me put, put words in my mouth, but apparently that's in there liar <laughs> um yeah he's calling me stupid and you can see the healing real time and you can listen to me cry even more who doesn't love that um so enjoy um thank you all and thank you obviously dr ham for dr ham Ham, hum. It, you you don't mess up either way is fine. 
Yamaha. Um, but uh, for, I mean, thank you so much for making, like healing me, first of all, so that I could write this book. Thank you so much for being there for me. And, and I'm just so grateful to you. And thank you for coming today. Um, the hearts. I'm so proud of you, girl. Ah. <laughs> See you later. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Bye.